All right, hello. I think we are ready to begin today's uh, panel discussion. Uh, thank you all for attending. My name is Megan Palmer. I'm the program manager for the Central and Southeast Europe, Europe program at LSE Ideas. Um, I shan't do a large introduction because we are very lucky to be joined by Nikolai Ratsu, who is the chairman of the Ratsu Foundation. And we are here in capacity of the Ratsu Forum, uh, which is part of our program's partnership with the Ratsu. So I will just hand over to Nikolai now, and he will be able to introduce the beginning of our series of talks. Thank you. Ah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the what is the first in the Ratsu Forum uh, LSE Ideas, ideas um, series of online discussions, which we're on, we are entitling 2020 Visions, Conversations on the Future of Democracy. Uh, our title today is uh, Will Democracy Survive in Poland, Hungary and Serbia? And let me just explain that the Ratsu Forum is a partnership between uh, the Ratsu Family Foundation uh, Ratsu Center for Democracy and LSE Ideas. Uh, we are a non-partisan international platform for open discussions about democracy and challenges, particularly in the Balkan region. Uh, Ratsu Forum was actually set up before the COVID crisis uh, and uh, to analyze and debate uh, the challenges, geopolitical challenges, social security challenges in the in the in the Balkan area which were already evident in, in our region before the um, before Covid uh, came and, and attacked us all. Uh, we had planned to do this uh, under more normal circumstances in Turda and Cluj as we normally do. Currently online obviously is our only, only option to do this and uh, so let me give you a, a very warm, warm welcome to this the first of our series. Uh, and uh, uh, wherever you might be looking looking at us from. We brought uh, together today three excellent speakers from the region uh, who I'll now let Megan uh, Palmer, our coordinator from LSE Ideas, introduce uh, for the discussion that she will be moderating. Thank you very much. So over to you, Megan. Thank you. Thank you, Nikolai. Um, well, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our three panellists who have been kind enough to join us to discuss uh, the situations in their respective countries. So joining us from Hungary, we have Eric Weaver, who is an Associate Professor of History and Political Science at the University of Debrecen. Uh, we are joined from Belgrade by Professor Slobodan Markovic. He is Professor of Political Anthropology at the University of Belgrade. And we are joined from Warsaw by Wojciech Kuzibilski, who is Editor-in-Chief at Visegrad Insight, which is part of the Res Publica Foundation. So the format for today's discussion is that we will give the floor to each panelist for a short period of time so they can explain what's been happening in their respective countries, or the countries in which they reside, and then we will open up the discussion and we invite questions from the audience. Uh, if you could please put your questions in the chat function, which should be uh, on the right hand side of your screen. And we will ask questions to the panelists and encourage a discussion about the country specific and the more regional issues facing democratic institutions. So I'd like to first hand over the discussion to Eric Weaver, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I thought uh, for a long time about what I was going to present, and since I've only got about 10 minutes, I thought I'd simply give some impressionistic anecdotes about how the Orban system works in Hungary with references to work by uh, people other than myself who have done very serious research on um, some of the issues I'm going to raise, um, and I'm going trying to describe things I haven't read about um, for the most part in English language media, um, things which uh, virtually all Hungarians living in Hungary, not outside of Hungary, but living in Hungary know about, 
um, but may not speak about for various reasons. Um, the first thing is the issue that I thought I would, would highlight very briefly of all the many, many, many interesting aspects of um, the regime and Orban regime in Hungary. Um, uh, the first thing I thought I would mention was the issue of elections and um, concerns about um, cheating or manipulating election results. Um, such concerns predated um, this current government, which uh, was introduced in 2010, but have only grown stronger since this government um, came to power. Um, some of the things I'm going to mention have been uh, outlined by a fellow called Gabor Tolka, who's written in English and German, I believe, um, on, um, on Hungarian elections. So the first thing uh, I should describe about Hungarian elections, and, uh, which is perhaps unique, although it exists in one or two other countries, but not, not most, is that you can vote wherever you are in Hungary. Most people vote where they live, but <clears throat> if on election day, you happen to be in a different district from where you live, you can vote in that district and your vote, vote will count um, to the results um, there. Um, as a result, as you can imagine, uh, any party that ha collects enough information about a particular district that um, enables that party to understand that um, the election will be very close in a, in, in a particular district, that there's a chance that they could win the election if they brought a few more voters um, to vote in the, that district that day, uh, will have an advantage. Um, and uh, who has a bigger advantage than, than a ruling government in collection, collecting information about um, voters? Um, in addition, uh, who has a better, better chance of bringing voters to a particular district than uh, a party that is genuinely popular and has genuinely um, broad-based support? Um, the most popular party in Hungary today, without a question, is the ruling party, Fides, Fides KDMP, if you wish. Um, there's no question that at any given time they will take at least at least 30% of the electorate. They would argue with me and say it's higher than that, but at least 30% and no other party can achieve those results. Um, and this is genuine popularity in Hungary. Um, so people can go vote in districts that appear to be shaky or, or, or close, and, and it looks like they might be able to wave, uh, win the election in those particular districts if they bring people. I know for a fact that this was done in my district as early as 2014, because my district in Budapest, I live in Budapest, I teach in Debrecen, um, because several of my students mentioned after the election how much they liked the, my neighborhood where they happened to vote. These were students of mine who were supporters of the government party at the time, and um, they took an advantage to take, uh, take a chance to take a, a, a free trip to Budapest to vote in my district and try and get the district to swing the way um, they would like to see the district swing. In fact, in 2014, as in subsequent elections, my district voted, went against Fidesz. It's one of the few districts that um, in every election, except the 2010 elections, has voted against the, the ruling party. So um, the governing party actually threw away votes by having by busing people to my district to vote. Um, uh, uh, they wasted their, their time and energy um, and money bringing people to my, my district to vote. But you can imagine if people are brought to a district where there truly is a slight chance of, of turning it, they might, they might actually turn the election um, and it's likely they did. This is, all, this is perfectly legal, this can be done. This is just one of the methods to, um, to um, to change, to try and bring the vote around the way you'd like to do it, to get the, the results you'd like to get. Another method um, that's used and has been reported um, uh, quite a lot in, in the Hungarian press, and I've seen nothing about it in the foreign press, is so-called chain voting. Chain voting happens uh, in the following way. Um, a vote organizer will go generally to a very poor area, and tell voters that if they come with him, 
And if they follow his or her instructions, um, uh, they will each get uh, a certain amount of money or some sort of remuneration. Allegedly, in one earlier re uh, election, it was a sack of potatoes that they would get, a large sack of potatoes for voting in a certain way. And um, naturally, very poor voters who may not care anyway might think, well, I'm going to get some cash for voting. I wouldn't have voted anyway. Why not? It works this way. When you go to vote, um, you go to the, uh, the, the election office, you go in to vote, wherever it is, you generally a school, you register, you sign the papers and you get the ballot, and then you go into a booth, fill out the ballot and drop it in a box. Well, in chain voting, you go in a busload of people or carload of people, you, the first person in the chain goes into the, goes in, gets his or her ballot, um, goes into the booth and puts the ballot in his or her pocket, then puts an empty envelope into the ballot box, the, the envelope hiding the ballot, and then returns with the, the empty ballot, the unfilled ballot, to the um, person who organized it, hands it to that person, in return for a sum of money or a sack of potatoes or whatever it is. That person then fills out the ballot in the way that he or she wishes the ballot to be filled out and hands it to the next voter who hides the ballot in his or her pocket, right? Goes into, registers, gets a new uh, ballot that has not been filled out, hides that then in his or her pocket, takes the ballot that's been filled out out of the pocket, puts it in the envelope and then drops that in the box. And again, in return for an unfilled out ballot, gets a sack of potatoes or whatever it is. Now, of course, these people, if they really wanted to, they could um, uh, foul up the, the chain voting system. It's called chain voting because people do it one after another. The chain voting system by scribbling over the ballot or filling in all the boxes and making it invalid, but um, the assumption is that many of them don't care anyway, and they just they just need or want the money. So that's another method that's used. The last method that's um, uh, been highlighted very well by uh, Gabo Tolka and others is uh, bringing registering voters from outside of Hungary into a certain district to vote in the elections in that district. Um, so there are infamous cases of hundreds of citizens of Ukraine who also have citizens, citizenship of Hungary being registered in the same house in a village in Eastern Hungary and then um, being bussed into Hungary to vote, um, bussed in by uh, the party with money and, and the ability to bust people. So that's one aspect of, of rule in Hungary that I think, I think um, deserves a little more scrutiny the cleanliness uh, of elections in Hungary. Another aspect I was not going to speak about, but it has become uh, unrelated to elections. It has become an issue in the past two days, and I feel I really must mention it, is the harassment of um, opposition people, or even people who make opposition comments um, to the media uh, who come from academia. I wasn't going to speak about this because things had died down. A year and a half ago, there was a campaign against a friend of mine uh, who teaches at a university in Budapest and who had been a, a, a very strong speaker at some opposition rallies. Um, that died down, but the campaign again began two days ago. And I'll describe how uh, people in academia and even outside of academia, the business world as well, can be harassed or uh, backing opposition parties or politicians. Um, the first way, the first method, it, it always starts with um, a press campaign, an accusation of some sort of uh, financial, let's say, um, nastiness. So somebody's cheating, somebody's embezzled money, somebody's got a grant and not used it the way they should have. Um, the greatest case um, that ha of this that happened since 2010 um, occurred in 2011 when Agnes Heller, who's since deceased, um, and some philosophers she was in a project with were accused in a, in a journal that was then associated with a newspaper that was then associated with the governing party 
of uh, misusing funding that they had received. And therefore they were um, taken to court and they had to just demonstrate to the tax authorities that um, they had not in fact misused any funding. In the end, they were found completely innocent, but the, the case took a good two years of their lives um, and, and uh, there were certain absurdities in the case, such as they had to produce every book that they had purchased with the funding and um, the tax authorities then took photographs of the ISBN, the, the price of the book, et cetera, et cetera. But they were able to show that they had done nothing wrong. The same tactic can be used against private businesses. Um, the tax authorities may come, your business perhaps has donated some money, let's say, to the opposition and the tax authorities may come and ask to look at your books. And you, of course, you're ready. You, you allow them to look at the books. They say everything's in order. They leave, everything's fine. And perhaps there's been an article, a newspaper article that has initiated this investigation. And then you think that's done. And two weeks later, they're back. And they look at the books again. And then again, they find everything's fine. And again, in two weeks later, they're back. And this is simply taking time, money, and energy from uh, private businesses, which uh, if any of you are engaged in, 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 in business, you can understand uh, what a great burden this can be to a, to a small business, to be audited again and again and again. Um, and no wonder uh, many people choose um, to simply keep quiet under this atmosphere. Well, the latest case, and then I'll, I'll finish because I think I'm running out of time. The latest case I thought I'd speak about um, was initiated, as I said, against a fellow called, a, a, a friend of mine called Ferenc Homer, who had been a speaker at opposition events. He's the chair of the uh, media studies, media and communication studies at a university called ELTA. And the case against him began in a journal that's online called Peshti Shratzok. When the journal sent out a call to students throughout Hungary to denounce teachers and teaching staff who um, engage in left, what they call left liberal rhetoric in the classroom, or who um, are guilty uh, of liberal terror in the classroom, uh, student then wrote an article about uh, Professor Hammer, Hammer, as we'd say in Hungarian, uh, in November 2018, accusing Hammer of spreading left liberal ideology in the classroom. Um, Hammer was then able to um, reject that, um, uh, got the backing of the university, which was um, quite useful for him, naturally. Um, and uh, was able to demonstrate that he had, he had simply cited other people's work. He was not engaged in any political ideology whatsoever in the classroom. He was simply teaching media on, at a neutral level as it's taught um, worldwide. Everything got quiet after that, uh, very quiet. Oh, and one of the accusations against Hammer was that he had claimed that uh, funding had been cut to the university to the extent that um, they were unable to do basic uh, repairs and renovations in his particular university. And he was able to demonstrate that at that time, um, that happened to be true of, uh, of his university at the time. Well, everything died down until two days ago when Peshti Shratzok brought up the charges again against Homer and said they had found incontributable evidence that somebody, incontrovertible evidence that, that a fellow named Gabor Poyak in his um, department was teaching, and I'm quoting now, the left liberal mantra of freedom, equality, equal, equal opportunity, and independence. Well, I don't know about you, but to me, freedom um, and independence could be not left liberal, but a conservative uh, creed occur. But for Peshti Shratzok, uh, teaching uh, freedom and independence in the classroom is absolutely not uh, not neutral. Moreover, they discovered that Mr. Uh, Professor Poyak had uh, funding from the Soros Foundation um, for some of his work. 
and some of his work had been critical of the media situation in Hungary, and he had assigned certain readings that were critical of um, the media situation in Hungary to his students. And therefore, this was proof that media studies in um, at Alta, not at other schools, at Alta, is in fact um, a, a, a bastion of Soros and left liberal ideology and, and, and should be denounced and God knows what else should happen to it. They haven't outlined what else they expect the government to, to do. Um, but this uh, Peshti Shatsok, which is affiliated in some way with the government, funded um, in some way by the government, has, has initiated a campaign again against uh, Professor Hammer and now against Professor Poya. So that's all I wanted to say. Um, hopefully, hopefully, um, that's enough. Thank you, Eric. Um, very interesting, the long-term grinding ways that the government and its bodies can uh, erode people's freedoms or perceptions of their freedom to do what they do uh, and the reality of it. Um, I'd like to hand over now to Wojciech to, to gain a perspective of what's been happening in Poland recently. Wojciech. Hi, thank you. Uh, as you know, we are in the midst of presidential election, election that were uh, election that was supposed to take place on the 10th of May, but without a good reason, uh, it didn't. And now we are uh, awaiting a new date, 28th of June, which uh, is a date not provided and not uh, provisioned within the letters of the con constitution but it's a political deal uh, that the opposition decided to make with the government in order to break the vicious circle of being only reactive to what's going on in terms of, of the political system and democracy in Poland. I would start with uh, mentioning three points where um, Hungarian situation and Polish is different. We've done a various numbers of studies on, on how Poland and Hungary in comparison is, are different and in which are, they are alike when it comes to democratic backsliding especially, but not only. And then I'll go into a couple of points that uh, Eric already made that are noteworthy perhaps for uh, further discussion um, on, on comparisons, on similarities that we can draw and we can see if this is, these are just similarities between our countries or they go broadly, um, uh, they can be extrapolated to, to, to other uh, uh, cases uh, around the world. So uh, importantly, we have, we, we're speaking of course of democracies, but they're different democracies. Hungary and Poland are democracies organized in different ways. Poland uh, has a, a institutional, in, institu institutionally ascribed diversity of authority when it comes to power in Poland. It is, first of all, semi-presidential system. We're now in the midst of this election, presidential election, that otherwise wouldn't be so important if you think how unimportant many presidents of, of different republics around Europe. Um, and, and in Poland, it is important, not only because you elect the president by direct popular vote, but also because the president is, the, the president office is the key to have a consolidated power in Poland. You cannot effectively rule as a government if you're in conflict, if you're in, in, in so-called cohabitation with, with, the, uh, with the office of the president. But at the same time, it, it's, uh, over the last 30 years, we, we often had a situation in which the president was from a different camp than the government, and that was exactly the, the setting of the, of, of, of the country that provided sort of institutional balance between branches of the government. And another important point on, uh, and on, on this point is the local government, something that Hungary already got rid of, uh, but also never had uh, developed uh, to the extent Poland has. Uh, Poland, perhaps even more than Germany, has developed a, a system of local government, uh, institutionally, again, very much independent with direct taxation um, from, from uh, personal income tax in one third and several other uh, independent incomes coming to the local government with uh, local government directly elected and self 
um, self-autonomous in their activity um, is another very important layer of activity also because of the size of the country. Poland is a country with many, uh, I mean, multiple, uh, um, multiple places where you have this uh, local authority. While in, in Hungary, essentially there is one, there is Budapest and several other very small cities. In Poland, you have uh, at least eight bigger cities, uh, comparable in size and, influ and com comparable and different in influence when it comes to the, uh, to the course of the, course of the country. So the second point is participation. Also, from what you can see on, not only on the streets, but in the, in the civic participation of, of Poles in the political process, but also overall in civil society, you have, you have a difference. You definitely see a difference. The difference is, of course, uh, uh, related to time. The time that Viktor Orban has spent in power, uh, it's been his 10 year now, and in Poland, the, any, any sort of, if, 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 we, if we even try to, fo to, to see it as a follow-up on, um, on, on Budapest, Warsaw has only had five years uh, in a similar direction, but not completely the same. And this uh, vibrance and the, 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 I would say the, the number of initiatives and also vocal protests that make uh, the government stop and step back is in comparison, in pure statistics, per capita even, uh, is something different uh, that, that you observe in, in Hungary. And finally, something that um, uh, I cannot disclose the name, but, but uh, a friend of a friend, uh, one is liberal, the other one is, is a conservative from member of the Fidesz government once said, uh, when describing the initial thrust of Poland into this illiberal world about five years ago, um, was an accusation by a true illiberal against Poland. Meaning, uh, while gentlemen were eating some lunch and discussing the situation in both countries, uh, Hungarian counterpart said, well, Poland is bringing a bad name to illiberalism. Illiberalism being this sort of a ideology or, or sort of a cover up for dysfunctionalities of democracy that are, uh, did have been just as explained by Eric. And indeed, in Poland, you, you cannot see that the government is in a perfectly legalistic way able to cover up all the dysfunctionalities. You very often see the mess. Uh, it's much more apparent, much more stark in, in the perception, and much easier uh, to track, to uh, name and, and shame. And also, this is why Article 7 against Poland has been, it's one of the reasons, not only one, uh, has been uh, initiated by the European Union because the mess, the legal mess especially, that has been created by the government is of uh, not only of, of, high pro of, of great proportions, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's uh, obvious and, and, and it's visible. While the, the government in Hungary uh, demonstrates uh, uh, and maintains, um, practically speaking, a legalistic uh, order. And then there are some there are some similarities, and speaking of Poland mostly, but I'll draw some conclusions to, 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 to see where we are with, with Hungary. Uh, there, is a, there is a similar rhetoric. Uh, there is a similar, you would often call it populism, but I can discuss it whether it's populism or not. Uh, there is this claim that democracy is more important than the rule of law. The will of the people, the sovereign, the, the voice of the sovereign, has been the main motivation and main rationale of the, of the government to go against uh, what is uh, the rule of law and social consensus, so social contract in many ways. In both countries, we, we deal with a, mass, a massive program of, of redesigning a citizen. In many ways, I mean, this is, correct. This is exactly what it is. It's a revisionist history, revisionist memory, changes and, and deep changes in education, putting a lot of emphasis of, of uh, ideal society, also society of some ideal type that the government would like to see and to model um, with pretty much masculine based and traditional values oriented, whatever traditional values are, uh, with, with a strong figure of, of the father, both on the family format, but also on the nation. 
and um, and many um, and many you would say moments where uh, the, the the government is trying to erase uh, the memories or the the history from history books from public spaces. Uh, both governments, at least Polish government, for uh, tries to perform active politics of memory, politics of memory that is uh, has an attempt is, is attempting at at redefining the past or the perception of the past. Two more points on similarities. Uh, it's about the exchange of elites. It's definitely exchange of the elites in both cases, both governments and Poland especially has been trying to do this uh, exchange of elites on every possible level. There has been the claim that the elites were corrupt uh, in justice system, in public companies, in, in the governments, in regulatory bodies, uh, but also uh, across the board, also including civil society. So uh, the tactics that otherwise you would call it a polarization strategy on political marketing is uh, in fact um, something more, something something deeper. It's some some sort of a, a, Bolshe of a Bolshevik in nature. We have the majority, and we need to replace the the people uh, according to the will of those who elected us, according to the will of the majority that we are representing. And finally, uh, very importantly, especially that uh, we all live in the age of post-truth, and perhaps that is that is where it all begins. Uh, at least in the Polish case, you have a lot of new speak, and that starts with outright lies, uh, but also this is uh, changing meaning, uh, changing meaning, uh, twisting the meanings and concepts. Um, I'm not sure sometimes if that is uh, misunderstanding or misreading uh, the opponent's claims and twisting them into the arguments you want to hear and you want to repeat and listen. Um, that new speak and the new language that is being used by the government uh, tries to capture the notions that are commonly acceptable about uh, fill them with the new meaning, the new, new meaning that goes along with the principles I outlined earlier and uh, that would secure the, uh, the high stakes in, uh, in all sectors from economic, civil society, media and, and the government. Uh, to to recreate a sort of a new Poland, uh, a new project. But I think importantly, uh, again, I'm, I'm I'm ending my opening uh, comments here with with this uh, reference to the ongoing election. The campaign is ongoing, scheduled June 28. I think there is an important change uh, coming, and it's already taking place in Poland, that is different than than Hungary. The opposition is much stronger uh, than in the case of Hungary. Uh, it also, uh, with the recent change of leadership and the new candidate for the president's uh, office, Rafał Czaskowski, the mayor of Warsaw, it's applying a new method. It's uh, applying a new method that the government, the, the opposition in, in Hungary has not been adopting from this uh, defending the status quo ante, the, the, the previous state of affairs, the ancien regime, you would say, if you, if you treat this as a revolutionary moment in Poland, um, they are instead the opposition saying, okay, we're going to play by those rules. We're gonna fight, we're gonna pick up the fight where, it, where we have uh, met on the field with the opponents. And we're gonna go not by the book of, of what was in the past, but uh, according to the rules, the new rules are set on the ground. They're gonna try to um, uh, make a stand and, and we'll see on the 28th of, of June and later on, it's a second, maybe most likely there will be a second round in two weeks time later on. What will be the results of a popular vote and what will be the political consequences later on? Wonderful. Thank you, Wojciech. I'm certain that we'll come back to quite a few of the issues you've raised to do with uh, structures of governance and the checks and balances, but also uh, this uh, key issue about the opposition, I think. Uh, but before we, we do that, I'd like to hand over to Slobodan, who I believe has a presentation to share uh, on PowerPoint. Slobodan. Uh, thank you, Megan. Mm. OK, 
Okay, so I will speak about Serbian stabilitocracy and COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, however, yes, okay, it works. The first point I want to make is that um, after this first decade of the 21st century, when uh, generally democracies in the Western Balkans uh, uh, had a tendency to, to be improved and to get better and better scores, the second decade was a bit different, particularly after the economic crisis in Greece. And uh, the results that we currently have, uh, you can see them here, um, this report of uh, Freedom House, uh, freedom in the world for 2019 actually shows that most of the countries of the Western Balkans, which are bolded in this chart, uh, not actually most, but all of them are categorized as partly free. So there is not a single one that is categorized as free. Serbia now has 66, and um, um, 66 points is also categorized as partly free. And this is a novelty because from 2000 to 2002 and uh, up to 2018, Serbia was um, considered as a free country. Also, the other report called Nations in Transit, you cannot see the whole report. I have to move it a bit, sorry, uh, because um, it's covered by... Um, It shows uh, that uh, in the past uh, several years, and that's why I really need to move it here, uh, there was a dropping, of, there was a decrease in rating, and the democracy score, the best one, of course, is uh, the highest one, seven. It was going down, down, and four, zero, zero, is a kind of a border between non-consolidated democracies and uh, hybrid regimes. What you cannot see now here is that Serbia in 2019 descended for the first time to hybrid regimes, just slightly below four, but within the context of uh, what is happening in Southeast Europe and particularly in the Western Balkans, uh, that's nothing uh, Specific, the only country that showed improvement recently is North Macedonia. But what is very specific is that the two countries that uh, were very much engaged in negotiating by chapters with the European Union, Serbia and Montenegro, they demonstrated decrease in democracy rates exactly during the negotiations by chapters, which is not a usual uh, sequence of events. Um, this is. Um, uh, these are the results of COVID, what happened during COVID. There are 249 deaths in Serbia, 11,800 cases. And what the government wanted the population to see is this chart to the left. So the government claimed uh, that um, uh, in Serbia, uh, number of uh, percentage, number of uh, uh, cases per 1 million is very low, one of the lowest in the region, in the world, etc. And this actually is more or less correct, as you can see in this chart. So the government, uh, because this is the most important indicator, uh, the government was uh, celebrating that. However, the government never uh, wanted to discuss this other chart, which actually shows that Serbia, in spite of the fact that it had a very low number of uh, Deaths, it has, it has had a very uh, high number of registered cases, actually one of the highest in the region. Um, what happened uh, here, this is from Worldometer, you will see that suddenly the curve changed one day ago by, uh, by a decree, basically. So suddenly the number of ca active cases out of 4,500 dropped to 400. They simply changed the definition of what an active case is, and they uh, moved many asymptomatic cases, even if they didn't have to uh, confirm negative tests to the category of uh, those who have been cured. Uh, but overall, um, the pandemic has uh, brought a lot of uh, uh, new challenges. First of all, the state of emergency was introduced. 
the state of emergency brought with itself suspension of certain rights, especially the freedom of movement. That was the most the drastic measure. People older than 65 were not allowed to leave their homes, not even for walking their dogs, not even for throwing garbage. Uh, there was very tough rhetoric of the president in the sense that he was uh, presenting the situation as very critical uh, with the possibility that many, many lives would be lost. So people were very much scared what, what would happen. And he, he uh, took advantage of the situation to organize everyday press conferences. The opposition reacted by peaceful protests. These were protests organized from people's homes because there was no other way. There was curfew from 5 p.m. for everyone. And um, what people were doing, they were blowing whistles, uh, banging on pots, playing music from their homes. And the government reacted to this by anti-opposition protests. And I will show you later the pictures. Those protests, in those protests, fires were used, uh, uh, various uh, uh, things that football fans use, and people were really terrified. It looked as if, uh, you know, uh, something something very dramatic would happen. Of course, the most important thing was the issue of proportion proportionality of measures, and I will just quote Belgrade's um, Center for Security Policy, their report, in which they say that Serbia introduced the strictest measures, even when compared with the rest of the world, during the period from the 6th of March to 20th of April, Serbia closed border crossings, closed schools, banned gatherings, expanded public transport, restricted, and completely forbade people's movement, movement at night and during weekends. And in so doing, Serbia joined the group of countries with the strictest measures against the coronavirus anywhere in the world. These are photos from Belgrade, what was happening during anti-opposition minutes. So, from, eight, from 5 past 8 p.m., there were these whistles and, and noise. And then uh, football fans would come to the top of the building. They would have loudspeakers. They would set fires. And uh, all the rest of the population, by the law, by the state of emergency, they had to stay at home. So if, uh, if fire appeared anywhere, what would have happened? Since they were. Uh, by the law, obliged to stay at home. This was a very, very tense situation that fortunately was resolved at the end uh, in such a way that uh, um, these football fans uh, stopped doing that. But these football fans, it turned out later, were uh, related to the uh, ruling party. And some of the people, some I mean, MPs from the ruling party, acknowledged that they participated in these actions. Uh, what was government's PR during the pandemic? Uh, these are quotes by the government. Shops are full, uh, which is not the case in most of the countries. Even sanitizers are available everywhere. This, by the way, was correct. Uh, so although it was a PR, it was a correct statement. Uh, second uh, thing which the president insisted himself is that uh, he has secured sufficient number of ventilators through his personal contacts. In other words, that he himself saved many lives and he himself delivered those ventilators to many hospitals and it was followed by huge media coverage. The death rate was among uh, the smallest in the world. The Serbia won the war against the coronavirus and at the very end, uh, every citizen of legal age indeed got 100 euros as government help during the uh, pandemic, which of course conveniently corresponds with the period several weeks before the elections, which are scheduled for June the 21st, and uh, many of those installments were given in the last week. Uh, the government still uh, reacted to two foreign criticisms regarding dog walking. It's interesting that foreign press didn't react to the fact that people older than 65 couldn't even throw their garbage but it reacted to the fact that dog walking was forbidden and Associated Press, Fox News covered it. So certain uh, uh, new provisions were made allowing uh, restricted dog walking. And also regarding reporting false information uh, under the provisions of the state of emergency for spreading false information, journalists could have been 
uh, detained and arrested, which happened in norm case, but after the EU intervention, it, it immediately stopped. Overall, uh, the government had a rather successful PR campaign. Polls conducted in April showed a huge support for the government measures, 90%, even for the most drastic ones, such as 24-hour curfew. I will here quote two analyses uh, of uh, the impact of the pandemic on civil liberties in Serbia. One was done by Friedrich Hebert Foundation. I will just uh, quote their own highlights. So they made those highlights. I just took them from the report. They say that the coronavirus crisis intensified the deteriorations and challenges of Serbian democracy, that parliament lost its role in the decision-making process, that the journalist was detained due to an article about the conditions in a medical institution, and they quote uh, Vucic, they highlighted his statement that European solidarity was just a fairy tale on paper. I will return back to that. There is another analysis by the Belgrade Center for Security Policy from May. They also insist that the uh, National Assembly was sidestepped, that the deployment of the Serbian Armed Forces was uh, visible, and that that was the busiest of the militaries in the region, as they say in their report. The state of emergency, they insist, was written for the military and not for civilian crisis management, and it was used, although there were other possibilities legal. How, uh, how to handle the, the pandemic, uh, that there were threats and pressure on journalists and activists, and they put a question mark, that's the last section, about the possibility of invisible presence of security services. Uh, the Serbian Prime Minister replied to lots of the criticism through Washington Times. She claimed that Serbian measures were comparable to what the vast majority of government and mayors in the United States have done. Um, then um, she insisted that Serbia established numerous quarantine facilities. Uh, they were criticized, especially the using of FAIR for as a temporary COVID hospital. And uh, she replied that, uh, uh, while I wish Serbia was in a position to establish temporary Hiltons, no country is at the moment. She insisted that Serbia, Serbian government adopted a five to six billion uh, dollar economic uh, stimulus package. And uh, the main point that she wanted to give was in the, in the very title of her uh, open ad. And that was uh, that uh, uh, fighting COVID-19 in Serbia is not a suppression of democracy. We can protect both democracy and our citizens from coronavirus. And the president, who was the main uh, star of the pandemic, uh, uh, he was present everywhere in all the media. He said that nobody uh, was a sadist, nobody wanted to torture people. We just wanted to save the country and our parents. That was the main uh, complaint of the opposition. Uh, of course, this all happens just before elections. and. Uh, there was a huge question to boycott elections or not to boycott elections. Lists have already been submitted. So we now know that out of eight major opposition parties, four will boycott elections. And projections are that the two ruling parties will win 75% of electoral votes of those who will vote. And that four other parties will pass the threshold of 3%. Uh, this, as you can see, uh, is increase in the percentage that these parties will win in the comparison with the previous elections. Uh, but of course, if uh, those four parties decided not to boycott elections, then the ruling parties would probably uh, score 10% less than is predicted here, although this is not a prediction, of course. But again, it would be very, very overwhelming victory. Uh, the coronavirus uh, was uh, made as a huge PR event for the government and for the president. Uh, Serbian parties are leader-centered. Uh, Serbian electorate is leader-centered. So uh, the president personifies his own party, the Serbian Progressive Party. Uh, so his appearance in media, even if he, he spoke uh, only about the pandemic, was uh, very much uh, 
something that will uh, be beneficial for his party in these elections. And uh, the result of all of this is that uh, the low level of support for the opposition parties, that was anyway a very uh, obvious, um, um, even before the uh, COVID pandemic, the inability to personify of opposition, lack of coverage of opposition activities, these were all complaints. Uh, this is all now uh, the same. And the situation that we expect after the elections is that there will be further fragmentation of the opposition, uh, that uh, unfortunately the liberal opposition is now even in a kind of uh, disagreement with the EU and the US, which called opposition parties to participate in the elections repeatedly. And uh, those parties, I must add, uh, they have boycotted the Serbian parliament in February 2009, but it is now questionable if this strategy will be successful because if four parties go to the elections, if they enter the parliament, they will basically fill the positions of these other parties and they are likely to be less uh, critical and some of them are even in a kind of uh, uh, special arrangement with the government or may, may make such arrangements later. These four parties that are most vocal in criticism, they have decided to boycott elections, they will not be in the coming parliament, and that may further uh, undermine uh, pluralism. Um, during the pandemic, there was a huge impact in the first month of the, um, of the People's Republic of China, and uh, the EU very gradually retrieved its major role. Uh, after that moment, the Chinese suddenly disappeared from Serbian media. In the first month, they were everywhere. Their, their team came from Wuhan. Uh, they were hailed as heroes who would help Serbia, etc. And in terms of PR, the president of Serbia claimed that uh, there was a lack of uh, European solidarity. And he again did something uh, that probably will uh, help his PR, not only in Serbia. He sent four airplanes with humanitarian aid to Italy, and the message was the EU is not, uh, didn't display solidarity, but Serbia has. And I made myself two photos just to show you what happened in Belgrade. This is just in front of presidential office, and this is a huge uh, um, slogan, the Chinese and the Serbs brethren forever, and the president called uh, the Chinese president brother in his, uh, and personally, uh, uh, made a sort of a personal, uh, first he personally came to the airport when uh, humanitarian aid and when the Chinese doctors came to Serbia. But then when the EU came back, suddenly these uh, 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 billboards appeared. Thank you, Europe. On, actually, I made this on, on, on the day of Europe, May the 8th. So uh, basically, uh, what usually happens in Serbian foreign policy, that's the oscillation between uh, the European Union and the West is uh, likely to, to continue. So, uh, in conclusion, um, what's going to, to happen? Um, well, um, the problem is that there, is in, there are increased domestic tensions at this very moment in Montenegro, Kosovo, and North Macedonia. And I think that they make the position of Serbia's president even more relevant. So the EU, which basically supported this stabilitocracy in Serbia uh, in the past several years, it did it uh, very much because it expected from Serbia to be very cooperative in resolving the Kosovo issue, since that issue has not been resolved. And since the new government just installed in Kosovo announced that they would be ready to continue negotiations, this makes the position of the president of Serbia even more important, since he is the main uh, negotiator on behalf of Serbia. Uh, the overall impact of the EU will depend on the level of investments, particularly investments from Germany. If they continue to be as high as now, this may or even higher, this will have an impact. If not, maybe some other actor can come. The Chinese influence will certainly develop on the level of 
confrontation between China and the West. But what is the most important is that stable autocracy is likely to continue, which may leave Serbia within transitional democracies in the coming years, or alternatively, which would be the best case scenario, potential bigger, bigger role of Germany could result in improvement of certain elements of the rule of law. Uh, another element very important for the Western Balkans is that if the process of EU enlargement is temporarily postponed, which can be the result of COVID crisis, then democracy will continue, is likely to continue to deteriorate in all the countries of the Western Balkans, because in spite of the fact that the EU uh, was not able to uh, prevent this decrease of democracy and that many EU officials even supported it in indirect way, uh, as you could see from uh, uh, what I mentioned in one of the first slides, whenever the EU intervenes, uh, there are certain results. So for instance, when the EU intervened about uh, uh, the arrest of the journalist, the journalist was immediately released. And I must say that the EU was the most important actor in North Macedonia and that the EU was able to make uh, an agreement between the opposition and the ruling party so that the opposition would not boycott elections and at the end of the day, the opposition won those elections. Something similar was attempted in Serbia but uh, it didn't bring the same result simply because the position of uh, the uh, ruling party in Serbia and the president was much stronger and uh, they made certain concessions but not sufficient concession concessions uh, for the opposition to participate in elections and now we are in this situation uh, with uh, upcoming elections in only three weeks and uh, two weeks and with the possibility that those elections could uh, basically either leave the situation as it is, a stable autocracy, uh, perhaps even worsen it, or only in the best case scenario, if uh, Germany becomes a more important actor, uh, it could perhaps even uh, slightly improve the situation. But for the time being, to conclude with that, stable autocracy remains. Uh, the description of the state of democracy in Serbia. Thank you, Slobodan. Um, this opens up a whole area that we initially had thought about uh, when we came together to discuss uh, the decline of democratic institutions in the region is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on on these institutions on how the governments have responded and so this really brings us up to date and i know that we've had a lot of questions uh, and so I'm, I'm not going to read them in order because i think that this leads very neatly into a question that came in uh find it. it's from uh, it's from stuart austin who's asked whether these serious challenges that the pandemic has presented to these three countries and to the region more broadly, whether they have also opened up some opportunities and perhaps some hope for the region and for democracy. Um, I don't know who would like to jump in on that first. Uh, there's also been some discussion about Hungary in the chat, so perhaps if we invite Eric to comment first. Well, I, I see nothing positive in terms of democracy coming out of COVID um, anywhere, not just in Hungary, but anywhere. Um, it's an unusual situation. Um, during pandemics, democracy is, for whatever reason, um, set aside in, in, in many senses. Uh, freedom of assembly is ended for <clears throat> quite sensible reasons and all sorts of other freedoms have to be set aside. And uh, all over the world, it should be a concern for us that this could become the new normal, it's just not just in this region. Um, um, if I may address another question in a slightly more detail that came up um, very quickly. It was a question about the, the recent, the 2019 domestic elections, local government elections, 
in Hungary in which uh, the new mayor of Budapest was elected from amongst the opposition and opposition candidates were voted um, to power in cities right through Hungary in a broad range of cities, even in towns where um, um, the opposition hasn't won for well over a decade. Um, and this was a great surprise to many people. Um, what happened in these local elections was something that for technical reasons will be very difficult to re reproduce in um, national elections. First of all, the, the um, opposition parties with one or two small exceptions, almost irrelevant exceptions, um, joined forces and in favor of one another's candidates withdrew candidates even at the last minute so that there would only be one candidate facing the Fidesz candidate um, in, in local elections. And wherever that happened, almost wherever that happened, the opposition candidate either won or came very close to winning. Um, this, for technical reasons, is going to be very difficult for the opposition to do at a national level. Um, for funding reasons, they lose funding if they don't run candidates in, in a certain number of districts nationwide. Uh, the other thing they did, uh, which was still legal, but um, I'm surprised it is still legal, is that in each um, electoral district where they had a chance, uh, members of their party or their organizations, local organizations who were on the electoral board, uh, recorded the results of the vote at a local level, and then they were able to tally the results of the votes from all local uh, elections in case um, they thought they had won an election and the national, the official results showed something else. Um, if they are able to repeat that at the national level, if there's no uh, rule passed stopping them from doing that, that could be very mm -hmm. significant indeed. They weren't able to do that until um, this last election. So far though, in the national level, they've hardly been able to get um, observers or participants into um, electoral boards nationwide, only into certain electoral boards. So that's it, thank you. I wonder if we can, oh, beg your pardon, now, that's okay. I wonder if the Wojciech might have a slightly different perspective on that because some of what he commented on was the structural differences between Hungarian and Polish uh, government institutions and the ways that regions and cities are run. So Wojciech, are you more optimistic about, about the opportunities that may have been presented by the pandemic? Well, for, for one reason, if, if you look at, at it very, very bluntly, um, the pandemic situation uh, postponed the vote. And because of the pandemic postponing the vote, um, you would say history accelerated. I mean, those systems are, those, those political regimes are doomed to fail. Uh, it's just a question of time. Uh, largely because they are, they're set up on the personal uh, 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 they have a personal attachment. They're anchored on, one, on usually on one person or or a very narrow circle of person that run it. And you cannot imagine a, a, a peaceful transition of power from those people to to anyone else. So you need to send, change the system. I think that 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 might be the case. That COVID perhaps not helped democracy, but definitely prevented democracy from failing immediately on the 10th of May, when the action uh, would, take, would have taken place uh, unfairly, undemocratically, uh, as the OSC mission was pointing out. And yet there was a huge determination in the governing camp to carry out uh, the vote on the 10th of May. And in that vote, according to the previous opinion polls, uh, the incumbent president would be a winner, perhaps even in the first round. So, so that scenario has been avoided, and you would say that's thanks to COVID-19, in a way. Uh, also, globally speaking, uh, all democracies, whenever they're democracies, uh, they're learning systems. Democracy is learning through its own mistakes. And I think all of the world is looking at South Korea, 
who su suffered immensely from MERS pandemic a couple of years earlier, with terrible losses in human life and terrible mess also in, in organization of the country and economy, but currently is living quite fine under uh, current stretch. Uh, they even managed to organize election that was planned in time, that was not postponed. And, um, and interestingly, initially, the opposition had an upper hand, but then, as in democracy, surprise is quite welcome. The government uh, won, but without any, uh, any fraud or any, any trick uh, uh, that otherwise we observe. So again, uh, pandemic might be a very, a very good uh, experience in a way for democracy, taking it, taking it into brackets, of course, that, that it is a, a big test for a political system at a great cost of, of human life. So there is, there isn't a, I, I don't, I don't think there is anything that COVID-19 has introduced new to the political systems that we knew, uh, that we know already. Uh, if you, if you look at Hungary, you remember the, you have to remember that the state of danger that was introduced by by Viktor Orban was just yet another version of the state of danger already introduced several times before. It's a it's a extraordinary circumstance uh, uh, for for those of you who who are readers of Karl Schmidt that gives you a immediate parallel. Uh, of, of what uh, Viktor Orban was trying by this state of danger state, exceptional state, state of exception, where a raw power coming from legitimacy as he's elected in office, already sitting in the office, gives him the power uh, to set up new rules as, as, as much as he likes and set them up. And you, even though that they're branded, uh, they're, they're under cover of, of, of uh, democratic uh, European democracy. And a state of danger before before pandemic was introduced for uh, for migrants. The migrant crisis uh, evoked uh, was was the the reason uh, Viktor Orban was evoking um, state state uh, in which he had superpowers, political superpowers. So COVID just simply sped up uh, things, and and this uh, ruling by decree was was one of these manifestations. Of, of, of next steps of otherwise um, uh, a logical trajectory. So I'd just like to bring in the Serbian perspective as we've discussed it in Poland and in Hungary. Slobodan, um, you talked obviously a lot about, uh, about how the government has responded to the COVID-19 challenge, but do you think that there's reason for Serbians to feel positive about anything that's, that's unfolded? Do you think there's been any greater civic engagement or interest in, in pursuing a more Western democratic understanding of, of political, gov political governments? Sorry, Sobodan, you're still muted. Okay, from the perspective of pro-liberal policies, uh, there is nothing to Nothing good to expect from the COVID crisis. I would agree fully with Eric. Um, from it's very similar to what he described, and uh, you, I quoted those um, opinion polls that uh, citizens were unready to uh, support very, very draconian measures such as total curfew, 24 hours, which fortunately didn't happen. It happened only during weekends and uh, otherwise was for people uh, of the group 65 plus. Uh, also, uh, in the meantime, the constitutional court in the region voted and the Bosnian court uh, found that there were violations of the Bosnian constitution, but the Bosnian constitutional court is very specific. It has also, um, it's the result of the Dayton agreement, but the Serbian, uh, Constitutional Court essentially rejected uh, um, uh, at least those um, uh, demands to basically decide whether the introduction of the state of emergency was constitutional or not. There, are, there is a set of other complaints that have been submitted to the Constitutional Court, but we will see. But uh, what is very interesting is that it unanimously rejected it. So. Uh, 
I don't see that, um, although many legal experts, even some former judges of the Supreme Court of Serbia said that it was uh, uh, enacted against the Constitution. Uh, this is more theoretical and legal question, even had court voted that it was against the Constitution, nothing would have changed. But the point is that um, uh, I don't see any, any, anything good that has come out of this. Uh, I think that uh, uh, basically some sort of authoritarianism was displayed and some sort of support for that among general electorate. And the only positive thing were those uh, was this expression of uh, readiness of people uh, to say no through these uh, peaceful protests from their bal balconies, but they were restricted to urban areas only. And uh, at some point, uh, that noise was re really, really very loud. But even that, um, that action only testified how divided Serbian society is. The divisions that were already there were just uh, uh, emphasized, they are even greater now than they were before. So from Serbian perspective, uh, I, I don't see any, any, uh, uh, any good results except that the food delivery system has been improved like in London, but uh, <laughs> that's the only positive outcome. Well, uh, I'd like to bring in another question, uh, but I'm just going to try and paraphrase it slightly um, from what you've said and what Eric has said particularly there's a concern over authoritarian measures in response to the pandemic um, one might suggest that in fact countries with very strong liberal traditions and democratic traditions such as uh, the UK and uh, France and so on we've also had very strict measures not, not as strict as Italy and Spain but we've had uh, a huge amount of popular support for very strict measures on people's movements, uh, criticism of the press and their response being too critical of the government and so on. Um, so with regard to the Central and Eastern European region and, and the Balkans, the question that came in from David Webster of the UK Romania group is that without wishing to minimise the liberal turn in this region, is some of this commentary this endless commentary about the backsliding of democratic countries in the region, is it counterproductive at all? Or is it providing a necessary check on, on these backsliding um, episodes? Um, so perhaps I'm, I'm going to go back to Eric for that one, because I think Hungary in the British media is particularly uh, prominent for this, this commentary. Well, um, effectively, um, the only check and balance left on um, the denigration of, of democracy or um, democratic freedoms in Hungary these days is um, in Brussels, is the European Court and European institutions um, which have overturned uh, Hungarian government laws and decisions um, in court and, and, and have upheld individual rights time after time. Um, this, is, this happened before this government as well, I should notice, note that, that the previous Hungarian governments also occasionally lost uh, cases in, in court and in the court of public opinion. And in this sense, um, the European press, the Western press is very important indeed um, in putting a certain amount of pressure on uh, politicians in the EU who quite frankly don't care about um, the state of democracy in Serbia or Poland or Hungary, just no matter what their rhetoric, what they care about is um, public opinion in their own polities. And I'm not denouncing them for this. That is as it should be. Politicians should be accountable to their own electorate. Uh, British politicians should not be too concerned about what's going on in Hungary. They should be more concerned about what's going on in Woking or wherever you wish. So, but um, when certain practices in countries in this region or in other regions are mm -hmm. described in uh, the Western press, this can provide a bit of leverage um, to affect positive changes 
here and elsewhere in the region. Thank you. And uh, as the slightly more optimistic voice in the group, I'd just like to ask Wojciech for your perspective on that. Do you find that uh, foreign media's commentary on Poland and its uh, battles with the judiciary, is this counterproductive for Polish de democracy or do you think this is a valuable criticism that they need to hear? Well, again, uh, that's, uh, you know, the, the, more, uh, the more you look into the media landscape, especially the, the English language uh, media that cover Poland, the more you see a stark uh, differentiation between Hungarian and Polish situation. Not only because in Hungary, most of the media are uh, dominated and owned by, <coughs> sorry, by the government and the government central, centrally managed um, media foundation that accumulated most of the other dispersed and independent titles under one umbrella, one ownership, and that they channel uh, one and the same political message. In Poland, it's not the same. Uh, public media has been taken over by the government, not to become public me media anymore, but they are now a governmental tube to channel political messaging and political um, ideology of the governing party point. I mean, that is also di diverge the divergence from the standards of public media is also a very polarizing message. This is the, the way that the government is building up their political marketing strategy. Uh, but, but you mentioned the, the foreign media, and in this perspective, that's very important because, let me say that, Poland has, is the, I think, the seventh in the, in the world uh, in the rank of non-English speakers, uh, uh, people who speak English, non-native non speakers who speak English. So that number of, uh, of people uh, having access to information and points of view on Poland that includes domestic media, unlimited access to the government propaganda, to the opposition propaganda, and also to independent media, which still in, in Poland there are plenty of. Not that they are not without that they are under uh, they are not under under um, uh, difficulties uh, also from the government. Gives Polish public opinion quite an array of of of, of access. Uh, it's not really a problem of, of international media in the coverage of international media. The, on the, when, when you mention the image of Poland, I mean, you have, you have more than 2 million Poles of the recent migration only. And then there are several other millions around the world that also have uh, electoral citizen rights to, to elect the politicians. And they take part in global discussion on Poland currently which is perhaps not the best for the, for the country under this government, but overall they are active participants. This is not the problem. I believe the problem when we talk about media situation is the local media. It's exactly what happened in, in Hungary. And it's actually what is happening all across the world, uh, US included, where uh, the local media, the, the small media, the, 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 the basic elements, the fundaments of the, of the fourth estate in democracies are under severe pressures, usually economic pressures, and they are uh, either dying out or they are being bought by uh, bigger interests, usually political interests, and they start to serve them. And again, case, you know, the, the, the closest to sort of a, an ideal extrapolation for where we're going is Hungary, where we could be going, where the government takes over those small media and, and limits uh, what we've been also calling in one for sovereignty information space so that you don't need Russia today, you don't need Sputnik news uh, present in the country to have uh, exactly the, their man. By the government, I think that was Oxford Research Institute um, finding. Uh, well, check. I'm just going to Hungary. interrupt because we're, we're losing the connection slightly from you. Um, uh, but also we're coming towards the last few uh, minutes or so of this session. So I'd, what I'd like to do is um, try to, again, sort of summarize a few questions. Um, I know that uh, a lot of the audience are very interested to know uh, what your thoughts are on, on how Romania compares to these countries. Obviously, this is a Ratsu Forum uh, co-event, and so uh, there's a lot of people. So I'd be interested to, to hear your ideas on how the countries that we've been speaking about uh, compare to others in the region. 
but there's also, I'm going to try and combine these two questions uh, because they're about external actors in the region. Uh, in the case of Serbia, uh, the European Union, of course, uh, Poland and Hungary are member states. Um, so there's a question about Chinese involvement in the region, which is mainly focusing on Serbia. Um, and the question is, um, well, could you perhaps slow down and talk a little bit about the role that China has been increasingly playing in the Western Balkans? Uh, and also a question on what can the European Union do to respond to these declining democratic uh, situations, particularly in Hungary, I'd say. Um, so perhaps we could start off, I don't know if, uh, well, perhaps Wojciech, as your publication covers the entire region more broadly, it's not purely the Visegrad Four. Do you have any comments on how you would assess Romania's experience of democracy and democratic institutions? Now I would not touch upon Romania that, because I wouldn't, I couldn't do it, you know, extensively. I I find that Romania definitely is undergoing a lot of changes still um, that do not, mm, well, let's say, they're they're putting Romania still um, in a situation where where it's it could improve, uh, definitely could improve. But at the same time, you see a lot of activity on, especially in recent civil protests, uh, the, 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 that give you hope that the government can have, uh, can be met with uh, checks uh, from, from the society. And then political process is going on. Then there, is, there, is, there, is, there are elements that we call corruption. There is, there is the whole process that um, most of the European Union countries are now looking at, uh, and the experiences of Romania in fighting the problems is is quite remarkable. I think uh, the, the recent appointment of Prosecutor General from Romania to the European Union uh, is is one of these examples where where you can see that uh, even from difficulties that democracies face, you can. You can uh, build it into strength if you can show how you can overcome those. Perhaps I'd like now to turn to Eric because Eric mentioned that in fact the European Union is about the only uh, institution that challenges Hungarian, uh, the Hungarian government at the moment. So Eric, do you have any thoughts on what the European Union could do beyond what they're already doing uh, to challenge Orban's government and their declining democracy in the country? No. Um, I'm really very cynical. I'm sorry about um, the effectiveness of EU institutions and I'm afraid I, I became um, extremely cynical six or seven years ago already and my cynicism has is, is just gotten worse. Um, I really expect nothing from the EU other than from certain EU politicians, um, serious uh, expressions of solidarity and, <laughs> and, and um, threatening to consider talking about doing something at some undetermined point in the future that will really be serious, such as talking more about this. So that's, that's my impression of the EU. Hopefully Wojciech will, will, will intervene and tell me I'm completely wrong. EU courts um, have been uh, effective at, at getting things changed. Um, at any time, um, something in the country, a practice, regulation or law in the country violates um, EU established um, treaties and regulations, uh, those um, regulations are overturned. Um, in EU courts, but in terms of other in European Union institutions, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just too cynical to give you a decent answer. I wonder if perhaps the answer would be slightly different from the Serbian perspective as an aspiring member state, but not an actual member state. Slobodan, do you feel that um, the threat of losing that path to joining the European Union, is that in any way a, a check on the, the less democratic instincts of the current regime. What's your thoughts on the EU's involvement? Well, uh, that the EU involvement is crucial for the whole region. 
but as I said, uh, the paradox is that uh, theoretically speaking, in terms of the theory of EU integration, transformative power of the EU should be very strong during the process of negotiating by chapters, which has been happening in terms of Serbia and Montenegro over previous years, but in reality, it did not materialize in that way. So these two countries are exception because uh, simultaneously with opening the chapters, their democracy scores uh, slightly, but uh, persistently declined. Um, on the other hand, uh, the EU has had a huge impact. And the very fact that the Prime Minister of Serbia replied to the Freedom House after this report was uh, uh, released actually shows that they very much care in the Serbian government, which is not the case in all the governments of the region. Some governments actually even want uh, to have criticism. Criticism from certain Western institutions is uh, a proof in their own uh, vision that they are right, but the Serbian government actually wants to have it. So uh, certain approval of this or that kind, uh, but they said very openly, several state officials, that they know that Kosovo is the key issue, that stability of the region is the key issue, and that democracy and human rights are not anymore issue number one as they had been at some point. So, uh, but uh, just to give you an example of what happened just a few days ago, uh, Serbia is different from Hungary in one very important aspect. Uh, in Serbia, the university is still autonomous, totally autonomous. Uh, however, the government tried to put under its own control institutes because th these are two different laws. There is law on uh, universities and law on institutes. Institutes are all state, almost all state owned. And the government appoints four out of seven members of the board and can control the institutes in that way. So in one of the institutes, which is known for criticizing all the governments in the previous several decades, the government appointed a, a new leadership. And uh, those who were employed, they raised a global public campaign against the government in which Fukuyama participated, Jürgen Habermas, uh, Noam Chomsky. And when the Serbian president got the letters from all of them, he dismissed that board and appointed totally liberal board last week. So that is a small victory. So I, was, I wasn't totally uh, correct when I said that there is not a single, now, now we have one exception. Uh, this uh, independence of uh, institute has been, it seems to a certain extent, defended. So, uh, but this is the result of international uh, international campaign. So those international campaigns, it's, it's also clear when Serbian prime minister wrote to Washington Times that he wanted to exonerate uh, uh, measures taken by the, uh, by the Serbian government. And uh, um, so yes, I think uh, that the EU may play a very important role and I think that there is one sector where the EU in Serbian case may indeed play a very important role and it is to make uh, electoral um, uh, conditions for free and fair elections better. Uh, in other words, to be a mediator between the opposition and the government because the EU has already done that in, Mas in North Macedonia. So we know that the EU is capable to do that. Uh, otherwise, of course, uh, the main problem of all those democracies and their, their problems how to consolidate, or actually they are not democracies anymore, but some kind of semi-democracies. The main problem with them is that internal actors that want to have, uh, uh, let's say, Western-type democracies in those societies are not strong enough. That is not something that the EU may help, and to the contrary, that's going to be, in that field, the situation is probably going to be even worse in the future because there is a huge migration of labor force, which includes young people, which includes liberally uh, minded young people to the West, which will probably be even 
increase. It doesn't affect only countries of the Western Balkans. It very much affects Bulgaria, and it significantly affects Romania and even Hungary, Croatia, countries that have much higher GDP than countries of the Western Balkans. And finally, in terms of, uh, uh, there was a question in terms of foreign involvement. Um, so two foreign actors are very present in Serbia, Russia, and China. But um, all the Russia is actually more uh, present in media. Everyone realizes that it is a PR thing between the Serbian government and the Russian government. There is, except the fact that Russia owns oil company, but Russia owns oil companies all around the world. There are no other very significant ties. Uh, exports to Montenegro until recently were bigger than to Russia, for instance, from Serbia. Uh, in terms of China, there was a growing, uh, uh, there were growing worries of the EU. The EU is not very happy for uh, uh, the Chinese involvement. Um, it views with skepticism the Silk Road and other initiatives. Uh, but basically this project, uh, we will see what will happen with that project, but the question was also whether uh, socialist way of China is something that in Serbia people would like to have. No, the answer is no, absolutely no. The reason why Serbia wants Chinese involvement is because China has uh, veto powers in the Security Council, the same applies to Russia. So it's just about this uh, conflict uh, between Serbia and Kosovo. And uh, outside of that, there are friendly relations, but there are friendly relations with other countries as well. Uh, certainly, ordinary people are thankful to China that it sends humanitarian assistance and doctors. But uh, the main question is, uh, uh, what will happen? Will, will this Chinese system influence system in Serbia? No, because... Uh, uh, there is, as long as there is EU framework, and that's the main point, all these countries have to operate within that system. So Chinese system is, is in Russian system, they are so different that uh, basically they cannot fit with that. This is basically the issue of foreign policy and the way how President of Serbia quickly shifted between China and the EU uh, actually tells you that uh, this is a part of nor, uh, usual, normal, manipulative political strategies and uh, uh, nothing more than that. But um, I should also add that China owns several very important factories in Serbia. So it certainly will continue to be present in Serbia in those terms. And, uh, and uh, there is another thing which, of course, may, uh, in how China may influence Serbia. Serbia, uh, Serbian government doesn't like conditionality imposed by IMF and the World Bank. I think it's similar with uh, Viktor Orban in that sense. So uh, uh, Chinese loans are better for the Serbian government because China, the Chinese loans do not include any stipulations, do not include any control. The Chinese loans include interest rates and whether Chinese companies should be present or not but they do not include the, the type of conditionality that, and the type of uh, following the development uh, and implementation that World Bank and IMF loans do. In that sense, maybe China will continue to be present if uh, you know, it offers certain loans that may uh, help Serbian government to stabilize the situation. Thank you. This is an opportunity for me to give the next of our talks a little plug to the audience. Uh, we are planning a, a follow-up to this talk as part of our series, which will be looking at the geopolitics of the Balkans. And so no doubt we'll go into more depth about China, Russia, the European Union, all sorts of actors in the region and what that might mean for the countries within the Balkans. I'm afraid we are out of time now. So I'm going to uh, avoid asking the difficult question to our participants, which is the title of the panel, which is, Will Democracy Survive in These Countries? Uh, it's clear that it's immensely complicated and it differs greatly from country to country, although there are similar challenges to all three. 
Um, so I apologise to the audience members whose questions weren't addressed. Uh, we had a huge number of questions, so thank you all for that and thank you for, for watching uh, our panel. I'd like to thank all three participants. So thank you Slobodan Markovic, thank you Eric Weaver and thank you Wojciech Wiesabilski. Um, and also thank you to the Ratsu Forum and to LSE Ideas who have been facilitating this panel today. So please do, if you have an opportunity, if you have the time, complete the survey that you'll be asked to complete at the end of, of this session. And we will be circulating information about future panels uh, in the coming days and weeks. As I say, the next one will be addressing geopolitics in the Balkans and we're really looking forward to sharing that with you. So thank you all very much for, for attending and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all.